Welcome to the Agile Wire, where professional scrum trainers Jeff Boobles and Jeff Molesky discuss agile topics. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Boobles and Jeff Molesky. And we are recording. All right, Mr. Boobles, kick us off, man. All right. So this week on the podcast, we got John Hernley on with us. John, can you give our listeners a little background about yourself? Yeah. So uh, I'm a change professional. I've spent most of my career working in the financial service industry, uh, primarily working within project management offices within the line of business uh, and helping to introduce more lean and agile practices into organizations. Uh, I came to that through a slightly different route than most. Uh, most folks come there primarily through a technology path. Um, actually, when I went and completed my undergraduate, uh, University of Minnesota, if you can't see it, uh, I then went on to law school. Uh, Ended up spending about $200,000 to figure out one career that I did not want to have, uh, which was to practice law. I was going back to get a degree in uh, psychology and going to pursue my doctorate. And instead, I ended up taking a job, short time, ended up finding myself working as a project manager and really discovering lean and agile, which is something I absolutely fell in love with, which really felt like the application, a lot of the psychological principles that I was really interested in. Yeah. Interesting. So like, uh, tell me, so how did it, so you started in a PMS project manager, like were you doing waterfall projects or did you, did you get, did you start off with uh, agile and lean principles right away? So it was, it was interesting. Uh, I actually stepped into a role. I wasn't supposed to be a project manager and how I became a project manager was one day someone said, uh, John, you're going to lead this project. Uh, I had no background in waterfall. I had no background in lean at that point. I had no background in in agile. And I was just told I was going to be leading this project. About a month after that, I was told, and you're also going to be leading this project. And it was the first time I was assigned to lead a software project. And so um, a lot of what I discovered was, or figured out was just a a journey of self-discovery where I was trying to figure out what worked. It was uh, operating mm-hmm. in a pretty chaotic atmosphere. And so the, the first project I led probably violated the norms of Agile and Waterfall at the same time. Uh, it was actually a persistent project that uh, continuously worked on a piece of software. And now when I look back on it, it's actually where I had a lot of discovery of the Agile principles as applying to that project. So, for example, we had a, a Monday meeting every week. And what we would do is we would look at the list of different ideas that we had and we'd prioritize that list, not knowing that what we were actually doing was was managing a feature backlog. Um, On that core team meeting, it was myself as the project manager. We had a line of business sponsor. We had uh, our our BA lead. We had our tech lead. We had our QA lead. We had our UAT lead. And then um, every Tuesday, we would meet with an expanded group that also included a lot of our different line of business users to talk about that feature backlog. And so unknowingly, what we were doing was really building a cross-functional team. It was a Mm -hmm. team. And what we ended up doing was really iterative waterfall, a more agile approach to waterfall. So I actually uh, got my hand slapped for how I was managing the project because I didn't know better. And the point I made in return was, but this is literally the most successful project the organization has. Why, instead of me copying everyone else who's struggling, why aren't they copying how we're doing things here? Because I'm literally pulling scope from other waterfall projects because I can deliver it more effectively than them. So it was, it was kind of an interesting shift. Then uh, some stuff went on uh, regulatory-wise. I ended up getting pulled into cleaning up a mess, and that's where I got started getting introduced to to lean methodology because a large waterfall project had implemented and essentially shut down the business and I got pulled over mm-hmm. to help clean it up. And so again, used more of an iterative uh, methodology in order to start pursuing the cleanup of the mess, at which point I ended up moving into the line of business and essentially started doing product before I really understood what doing product really was. So I want to jump in here, a couple of a couple of questions as you were going through that. Um, firstly, like what comes to mind? Maybe, uh, I'm tr- sorry, trying to think about how to articulate, but like today, when you would want to give somebody the lead on a project, like what are com- some of the key things that you're looking for for that project manager uh, in an agile environment? 
Yeah. So, so for me, one of the big struggles project managers uh, have in large organizations is that they, they should have a, almost like what you call a God view. They should understand everything that's going on related to that project. But the reality is, is most project managers are allocated a certain scope and they don't necessarily know how that scope interconnects with things that are occurring in the ecosystem around it. So that's kind of that shift between project management to portfolio management and that recognition that these projects really represent a change that exists in an ecosystem and that in order and in order to be able to effectively manage that project, I need to not only understand my project and its scope, but I need to understand how it fits into the larger context. And so for me, what, what I'm looking for for the project manager is, are they really aligned to the outcome of the project, like the business outcome that it's trying to deliver, or are they more aligned to the scope and the methodology? And my, my experience has been is that when the project manager is more aligned to the scope and methodology, there's nothing there but unhappy surprises. Mm-hmm. They, they lose that freedom of mobility, and it kind of ties back to that, that shared understanding of leading with the why. When the project manager is able to lead the project team and connect them back to the why, the same way a product owner should be doing for, for their, pro, their backlog, um, you start getting some happy surprises. You start seeing people saying, hey, this, we're off course here, and as opposed to the recognition that it's off course when the project implements and the business outcome is not actually delivered. And so I'm really looking for someone who's connected to the business as opposed to someone who's just trying to focus on the triple constraints and how to apply the, the PMBOK methodology. So more of that visionary uh, decision maker kind of uh, role, right? Like that's kind of what you're looking for so that you can set that course that why, you know, that is, that is missing in a lot of more traditional um, projects that I ran. Uh, it's very easy just to go through the activities and the motions and, and f- do the scope and, and not focus on, on the why. And that's when we get into a lot of waste, I think, you know, like those stats of, you know, 80% of features are rarely used or never used that are developed um, in technology. So yeah, that that's a pretty common, common one, I think there. So and it, it, it's a big gap that can, um, that we can have. Uh, so it, go ahead, I'm Jeff. sorry. What, what, what is, man, I just feel like I'm going to put you on the spot with this question, John, but what does it mean to be off course in an agile environment? So you were saying like w- one of the things that you're looking for is, is that project manager to identify when you're going off course, but like, what does that mean? Yeah. So, um, you know, bring out the nerd in me. So the, uh, uh, the difference between activation and utilization, you know, utilization is about getting closer to a goal. And so in order to ensure that the project resources are being effectively utilized, you have to understand what the goal is and you have to be able to move closely or more. every activity that you're involved in should be attempting to move you more closely to that goal. Now, most projects are just a lot of activity, but a lot of activity, as, as you know, Jeff, as you were saying, it's waste. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not nece- mm-hmm. actually necessary. Now, that activity um, may be an actual implementation or creation of a feature. It may be an experiment to have a better understanding of what do, doesn't work. Um, but so for me, when, when I think off course, it's I'm focused on the wrong thing. The activity, even if successful, even if I get the desired outcome, isn't actually going to help me get closer to that goal. I, I may be building something that's useless in the marketplace, or I may be conducting an experiment where at the end of that experiment, I say, well, now I know something, but what I know doesn't actually help me with my next step on my journey. Okay, that that makes a, a whole lot of sense. Because what what I was a little bit concerned with was when you said off course was in my head, I substituted date. Like, are we off from the delivery date? Which I think is more in line with a typical project manager who's tracking to a milestone, tracking to a date, and then is there to identify when we are now off target from that. Which is very different, at least to me, than what you just articulated there. Jeff, what does it mean to you to be off course? Well, that's, that's, that's what I was thinking as well. Um, but what I'm kind of curious about then, because what I'm hearing is it's that person who identifies when we're not delivering the types of results that we had initially planned for. In, in my world, that's the product manager or the product owner or the, whoever is accountable for the value aspect of whatever the initiative is that is being worked on. 
And so what I'd like to hear your thoughts on, John, is like where in a, in a shared world where we do have those two roles or accountabilities or however we want to think about them, like how do they work together and how do we, is there duplication there? Do we need both of them? Right? Like what are your thoughts with that? No, it's a great question. So really for me, um, I would equate the product manager in a waterfall environment to the sponsor. And so even in a waterfall world, there is that second party there that is the project sponsor. And ultimately, the, the project manager is there to assist the project sponsor in delivering the outcome this project sponsor is ultimately accountable for. So I think there's this misconception typically in the project world that it is the project manager that's the single throat to choke. But in the reality, it, it is really the sponsor. However, in a waterfall world where the sponsor typically has, you know, a second, third, maybe fifth or sixth different job, sponsorship is about this much of their day. And to me, that's one of the problems that uh, moving to more of a product centric, agile environment solves is that product manager recognizes that is their accountability. But but a lot of sponsors don't. Uh, project, I've operated in relatively few environments where we've had really strong project sponsorship. Typically, the project sponsor doesn't understand how outcomes are actually delivered. And when that exists, what ends up happening is they're relying heavily on the project manager and they see something going off course. And so what are they going to do? Well, they don't know how to course correct it because they don't actually understand the underlying ecosystem and how work is done. But they do know that the project manager is there. So they apply pressure to the project manager. And they apply that pressure to the project manager, hoping that the project manager will then go to the right spot to get them the outcome that uh, that's delivered or that needs to be delivered. Well, the end outcome is that it creates friction in that relationship. So the two folks that should be operating as a, as a close partnership, the sponsor and their project manager, actually can end up becoming adversarial because the project manager becomes resentful towards the sponsor because the sponsor sees problems. And instead of helping the project manager solve them, they just apply pressure. And that's where, you know, in, um, in an agile world, oh, that project manager having folks that are caring for delivery um, can, can result in a really strong partnership because a lot of the, you know, I know, Jeff, you and I have had this discussion before. The product manager can't be pulled away from the technical team. They need to be that voice of the why with the development team. They they can't uh, hand out their obligation to understand the customer. They have to be that voice of the customer within the team. But uh, like doing true product management, it's a really hard job. There's a lot of stuff that they're accountable for. And so there are certain activities that they can delegate to a trusted partner, whether that's delegating some of the feature or excuse me, some of the user story writing to the development team or some of the project planning type work that needs to occur in product management to a trusted project manager, you know, release train engineer, whatever, whatever is appropriate in order to have that effective teaming occur, not just within the scrum team, but also some of the other activities that need to be completed. So when we say, of course, I think I've heard this kind of talked about, but are we saying our number one indicator might be lack of delivery? That's maybe what I would say. Like maybe we just, breaking it down kind of from what we were talking about before, and then maybe we can dive a little deeper. Yeah. I mean, when you say lack of delivery, I, I would say, you know, l- lack of getting stuff done because it's not necessarily yeah. delivering a feature to the marketplace. That might not be the next best step, but you know, this, this whole idea of, of planning and we we're all aware of the misconception that agile doesn't have a lot of planning to me. Agile is the recognition that you know plans are useless. Planning is essential. So we're constantly planning but you're also constantly delivering. There's something that's going forward. Something is getting too done in a short increment so that you can either recognize the value earlier or you can learn from it and then be able to correct your course and replan based upon mm-hmm. the new information that's come in. Right. Think- so, yep. So it might be not full of market delivery. It might be something that you can validate an assumption. It might be something else, right? But some type of delivery, that's maybe where we get off course. And I think maybe one of the things that's different about um, the, the project manager or uh, product manager that we were just talking about, or maybe a product owner and a scrum master that we were talking about before is, is how we do it. It, it. They're similar roles, right? Like you having distinct roles is important there. Like one's more of a focus on value 
Uh, they're close on what's the right thing to be doing, where are we going, that vision, that strategy, that product strategy. That's product owner, product manager in a lot of sense. But then the scrum master may be in the project project manager. May, are they two different things? Like in some organization, maybe they do similar things. But what I've seen is project managers more hands-on. I'm going to make sure that we have a culture of delivery. We have a culture of things not stopping us. We have a culture of we're going to move forward. And a scrum master maybe just is more on creating like and so they're not they're the ones with the little hands off and to do it a little bit more indirectly where a project manager may be doing it where the scrum masters may be doing like creating a culture for something like that to happen i don't know what are your thoughts on that like that's that's been my experience is they're all after the same thing different roles but like how they do it tends to be pretty different so i, I, would, I would agree that that's the tendency i would i would question whether it's necessarily different or whether it's just different and so, I mean, so for me, the, the scrum master within the team, if the if the product owner is the what we're working on and why we're working on it, the team is who is working on it and how, and how are they going they're going to work on it. The scrum master is how well, how well does the team deliver? How well does the team improve over time, etc. Um, project manager, I think, is typically viewed as a much more command and control position. Mm -hmm. And it, it's very much looked at like, you know, I'm keeping you guys aligned to a schedule, but I don't necessarily know that that's the most effective way to be a project manager in most, in most environments. I think uh, the ability to bring an informal team together and actually have them operating as a team, as opposed to uh, what I would describe as a work group, you know, work group being a collection of the individuals that are working around on related tasks, but they don't have a shared vision. They don't have shared language. They can't engage in constructive conflict. So in some ways, that scrum master, they know who their team is. It's the scrum team. Now, the project manager is, is if they're doing their job well, is, is forming an informal team, usually at a higher level than the scrum team, because, you know, usually it's um, it's either it's not just necessarily one scrum team's backlog that the project manager is uh, is kind of fun tying together into a project. It's. So it's usually that higher level team, but you know some of that same idea is like helping ensure that the, that the sponsor is creating a shared vision in the team, helping make sure that the work is is uh, is being delivered incrementally. Because I think one of the like misconceptions of the word big bang is no project is successfully delivered big bang. I mean, even within the phases, there are additional you know sub steps within each phase that need to be hit. It's just the difference is that they're trying to build a car in phases as opposed to going from the, you know, the skateboard to the scooter, et cetera. And most projects don't fail because folks don't work hard, uh, particularly in the days leading up to release. It's usually an absolute mess. I mean, I always describe a, a waterfall project as a series of near failures followed by relief because that's that's how it feels to most project managers and most project participants. We're almost going to fail. We're almost going to fail. We're almost going to fail. We're done. No enjoyment, no celebration. It just, it doesn't feel great. But the reason why most waterfall projects miss their target is because there was some date in the past that the team was unaware of, some incremental deliverable that needed to be delivered that was missed. And the project team didn't understand at that time how increment or how instrumental that, that incremental delivery was to actually setting it up for long-term success. And the project was red, but they thought it was green. It was sitting there like a big, mm -hmm. fat, juicy watermelon at that point. It was green on the outside, yeah. but it was bright red on the inside. Yep, I agree. I think that that's, uh, that's one of the things, you know, it's the heart, it's the courage, right? Like it's all the hard stuff. It's like having the courage to say, let's go to red earlier. Uh, we have risks. Let's it's not just put them in a register as a project manager. Let's do something about them. We have, we haven't been delivering what's stopping us. Let's address that. Even though we have months before this big deliverable date or whatever, like let's, let's try to, we're going to make mistakes. So let's embrace that, get to that point, then figure out what to do next. So like, you're just a failure all the time. You're on that edge. Uh, I think that that's what good scrum masters are doing. That's what good project managers are doing. And so, but it's very easy to say, no, let's just plan, plan, plan. And then, you know, the big stuff happens at the end and it all kind of comes to a head. So why do you think that some of that though, like the, one of the biggest differences, you know, when you were talking about projects versus products here, 
is, is this idea and projects of, of individualism. Like I just need to get the right people, keep them busy. We kind of mentioned, you know, touched on that just a little bit before, but like, do you think that individualism is kind of a core part of projects that maybe is just faulty? I don't know. Like it's just a, so, so I, I, hundred percent agree with that. And, and the reason why is with a, with a waterfall project, it really is, it's not a team. And so what you often see in, in a waterfall project is everyone's worried about their piece and they're worried about their piece being done um, before they get blamed for their piece not being done. And so when you're not working in a team environment, when you're in a work group, often what I've experienced at least is that folks are looking how to avoid blame as opposed to how to share success. And so mm-hmm. they're very concerned so you, uh, about, is this a missed requirement or is this a defect? But, but at the end of the day, it doesn't work. And so as mm-hmm. a team, they have failed, but they, they don't see it that way because they're, they're not a team. And so for me, one of the big struggles I've seen moving from, um, from a waterfall-based to agile-based is the organization construction around individuals and the celebration of individualism as opposed to mm-hmm. the, the focus on building high-performing teams. Because to me, it's high-performing teams that actually translate into great success. And even the waterfall projects that I've been uh, involved in that have ultimately been successful, it was because there was a core team there that was committed to delivering an outcome that was able to consistently rally together in a way that enabled that outcome to be delivered, as opposed to you know, the project manager showing any sort of individual heroism. Because I mean, at the end of the day, most project managers are not hands-on keyboard. They're not the ones writing the code. They're not the ones developing a tool. They're relying on the, the, the larger team to do that. And if they're not operating as a team, that, that project manager is going to have a tremendous struggle being successful. Mm-hmm. So it's what interesting. You, oh, ahead, Jeff. I, ahead, I was Jeff. just going to chime in. Um, as you were talking about that, I apologize. I've already kind of forgotten how you articulated. My mind was wandering as I was thinking about it. One of the last initiatives that I was working on prior to leaving Acorns, um, <clears throat> they're, they're still going through, so I can't talk too much about it, but um, one piece of it had landed on my roadmap on my team. And that's exactly what I thought about when I was building it out was, one, I did not give a single fuck about that thing because like that did not fall in line with my vision for what I was going after. I was in the ops area. I was trying to make life fantastic for our customers, removing root causes. If they had to reach out to us, making sure it was a fantastic experience for them, looking at the tools that we could leverage for that mm-hmm. um, had nothing to do with any of that stuff. But it wound up on my roadmap because it was part of the strategic initiative that the org was working on. And the two things I thought about was, one, I don't want to be the last one. I don't want to be the long pole in this. And so I bumped it up and prioritized it over basically anything else that was on my roadmap. Um, and and two, but like, I, I just didn't care about it. Like, I, I understood that, yeah, this was important to the organization. So I, like, I'm being a little bit facetious here, but it was not in line at all with the things that I wanted to deliver for, for the customer um, versus the things that I, I I needed to just get done and off my roadmap. And I feel like that's the feeling that I have when I'm in a work group where it's like, I'm just doing this because I have to do it. Uh, not because it's in line with any of my bigger goals that I'm, that I'm going after. And right there, like there, I feel like there's dysfunction that's naturally built in uh, to that sort of working group or that sort of system. No, I a hundred percent agree with that. And I think that's um, one of the struggles, particularly in larger organizations is everything is constructed around individual performance. There's, there's not really good measures and attributions of team performance. It, it tends to be a focus on how did this one individual perform within this larger team and how do I assign individual credit as opposed to just being comfortable with the idea that this is a successful team and we want to preserve and reward a team for operating in a way that's effective. So, so why, like, wh- where, where do you think that comes from? So, so for me, I mean, th- this is pervasive in our society. There's this myth of individualism that exists in the United States and uh, where we want to attribute great performance to individuals, not to teams. I mean, there's examples in the sports realm and the business realm and in the sports realm, you have, uh, you know, 
he's Michael Jordan. A lot of people consider greatest basketball player ever. Um, I don't, but I might be. <laughs> as a Bulls fan, but when when Jordan took that break in basketball, um, the full year that he was gone, the Bulls won three games fewer in the regular season than in Jordan's last season. Uh, they went to the semifinals. They took the Knicks to seven games. Uh, Knicks had home court advantage. Home team won every single game. Bulls almost upset them in game five, losing by one point. I, I believe there was a questionable foul call on Scottie Pippen in that call that made the difference in that game. Um, it was a great team. I mean, Scottie Pippen, Horace Grant, BJ Armstrong all made the all-star team that season. So it was still a really good team with Jordan. Not to say that Jordan wasn't great because he clearly was great and his inclusion on that team made it that much better, but it's, it's teams that win. I mean, same thing with, with Thomas Edison. I, I know a controversial figure in some circles, but one, in my opinion, one of Edison's greatest inv- inventions was the modern research laboratory at Menlo Park. Like he had a team of, of scientists that helped support his, his inventions. And so, yes, he, as an individual, he may have great thoughts. He may have been uh, individually brilliant, but it was really the team around him that set him up for success. And so when I look at like corporate America and how we measure individuals, there's still a lot of focus on individual performance reviews. And um, in one of my recent jobs, I will admit I, I, I had a struggle within a scrum team because I had multiple people assigned to a scrum team. The scrum teams, some of these scrum teams were highly successful and where I had multiple individuals and I'm working on a force distribution model where, you know, 20 percent of people are either, um, you know, need some sort of performance improvement. 60 percent of people are right there in the middle. They're meeting all the expectations Then another 20 percent are above. If you have teams that are performing well, how, how do you parse that out? How do I say that this person on the team is contributing a little bit more. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible, but the traditional uh, management where it's just, I'm taking a look at the outcomes that are delivered and that's all I'm interested in. I'm just looking at the metrics. It's all I'm interested in. It's really tough to distinguish between uh, people who are helping raise the performance of people around them or those who are being carried by people around them or, or people who may actually be impeding the progress of those around them. And so uh, what that requires, in my opinion, is a, a shift from that management method or mindset where it's, I'm here to distribute work and I'm here to jump into fire drills and help clear them to I'm a, a leader setting context and I'm a coach mentor who's actually observing your performance. And I can speak to not just what you're doing, but how you're doing it and why are you doing it that way? And that actually requires that the leader absorb some of the context, not for the purpose of micromanaging, but for the purpose of actually being able to provide that person some meaningful feedback on how mm-hmm. they can continue to grow and improve in their performance or identify where that person really is an exceptional performer. Because I think we've all worked with some of these folks. Uh, there are certain people who you're just better around. And a lot of times those folks don't necessarily get the note yeah. that the appreciation that they should, because what they do is they raise the performance of the team around them. But it's difficult to point out exactly what does this person do that makes them special, makes them unique. It's not their individual brilliance. It's something about the team yep. around them that just responds to how they how they interact with others. Yeah, it's almost like if we had a two by two grid of like performance over here and like culture over here those culture protectors that are like really good at like increasing a culture where people want to come to work and work together and collaborate and work towards shared goals. Right. Like that gets overlooked a lot. I mean, you feel it on the team every time you have those people there. Right. But like what happens when you have high performers, but they're low in culture and they bring that culture down. Well, it looks good on paper, but man, those teams, they're, they're tough to be on. You know, you lose a lot of people. Maybe they don't actually end up delivering. They do a lot of stuff, but you know, delivery is not good, but if you got high culture, but no performance, like that's not very fun either. Right. But fun place to be working at, but nothing gets done. And so that's, that can be disheartening as well. So it really has to be a bad balance between, I think both. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Like it, and that's the hard thing that we don't measure, I think, or we don't, we don't recognize or don't even talk about often in organizations. No, I as those culture protectors. agree a hundred percent on that. And, um, I thought this was a fairly common analogy because I've often used it within my team. Um, 
I did a little research on I, I was to see if someone tells the story better than me. I couldn't find an example. So if um, what I talked to my team about is the difference between horses and camels. And so camels can actually carry about um, one and a half times the, the load of a horse. You know, I think a camel can typically carry 600 pound load, horse only 400 pounds. Now, a camel can also eat dang near anything. I mean, that's in the, in the desert, they can eat the desert plants that are available. Horses, mules, they can't touch that stuff. Uh, so actually, of their 600 pounds, they can actually, less of it is that their own food than a horse. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, camels are famous for not needing a lot of water. So if camels are better in all those ways, why don't humans leverage camels, except for in extreme environments where they have to leverage camels because horses simply aren't viable? Well, the reason why is camels spit and camels are stubborn. They're, they're, ass, they're assholes. And so when, when choosing, you know, along those two dimensions to work with a very, very productive camel or a slightly less productive horse, but the horse isn't an asshole, humans want to work with the horse. And there's a lot of people that I've encountered in my life, um, who I would describe as camels. They were they were brilliant at their job. They were high producers. I had some of my team. And I remember a couple of them, I won't call them out by name, of course, um, that when I found out they were going to be leaving my team, I thought, oh my goodness, this is terrible. Like I'm losing this person. What am I going to mm-hmm. do without them? And then um, two, four weeks after they left, I thought, oh my goodness, it is so great not to have this person around anymore because what I didn't realize was the amount of mental and emotional energy that I had to put in to their current level of performance. Because as, as a leader, I'm more than happy to invest in someone's development. I'm more than happy to invest in helping that person grow into who they want to be. And, but that's an investment in their future level performance for, for someone who's difficult to work with. That's not an investment in their future level of performance. It's just trying to get their basic current performance out of them. And that can be extremely draining, not just for the the leader, but the team that has to work around them. I think uh, I think Marty Kagan, in his, his book, uh, Empowered, he refers to the no asshole rule. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what I think you need to to avoid. But that's not that's not really a dimension that is typically focused on in traditional performance reviews unless it rises to the the level of, you know, this person is doing something that's an HR violation or, you know, et cetera. But oftentimes those people are rewarded for their individual contribution, even though they're muting the performance of the team around them. Yeah. Jeff and I worked at this organization one time and they kind of hired on three main principles, hungry, humble, smart from Patrick Lynchiona, the ideal team player, right? And the humble one, like being team oriented, you know, like focusing on making everyone around you better that was probably the hardest one in an interview to recognize. And then like when you had to help somebody through that, also probably the hardest one to to, to, to help somebody change. But I don't know when you had that hunger, we had some emotional intelligence, right? Like, I don't know those ones we could probably tell a little bit easier. You can tell in an interview. Um, You can work with somebody on that, figure out what motivates them, things like that and and work on that. But uh, those three things are, are, are good indicators, but the humble one and that like no assholes, like that's, that, that can be tough. I don't know. Kind of made me think of this other saying that I hear all the time. And I, and I, I always reflect that on with clients. Like when we're talking about something similar, like, Oh, this person's such a good performer, but like, man, it's hard working with them. It's like, well, your culture is what you tolerate. And so if you tolerate that asshole behavior, that's what you're going to get, you know? And like, are you just stronger without that person? Or do we need to have, you know, call that out right away? Or do we give that person rapid feedback like and not tolerate that in the moment, you know, whatever the thing might be that we're, that we're referencing. So, yeah, I, th- I think that that's a, that's a hard one for people because sometimes we go back to that individuals and it's like, well, we all think about performance and activity and we want those elite people. And we, we really uh, lean towards that, especially in the U.S. Um, we, we like our individuals um, instead of thinking about what's best for the whole entire team. Hey John, I was kind of curious when you were when you were talking about that earlier. Um, the incentives, <clears throat> excuse me, the the incentives that you were talking about, and how as a leader do you know whether that individual is you know p- 
r raising the, the tide or lowering the tide with the people around them. Um, I would expect that the people who are best equipped to answer that question are the people around them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and why we, and maybe this is right in line with what you're thinking about that, that individualism versus teams, but like handing over more of, I, I don't know if accountability is the right word, but like the ability to self-manage, I think is what I'm getting at, where, you know, you give the team the power to take action um, and to, you know, add or remove those types of either characteristics and or people from the environment in which they're working. Um, have do, do you have any, I know a little bit more about your history, but i curious, do you have any experiences or experiments that you ran um, with giving more of that power to teams to self-manage? Um, you were talking about incentives earlier, like transitioning away from I as the leader are incentivizing versus setting up an environment where the team can incentivize themselves um, and, and uh, govern accordingly. Yeah, so uh, so within a, a project management office, I actually did a self a self assembly exercise. And so we were going through the transition from a portfolio that was primarily waterfall based to one that was primarily agile based. And with that came a, a need to reset some of the project management roles. Some of the folks were going to be working on stuff that was more product aligned. Some of the folks were going to work on some of the projects that were not necessarily aligned to a product. So, for example, return to office. There, there's no there's no there's a project for returning people into an office or sending them home in this case but there's not necessarily a product team that's gonna be working on that. And so as we were going through this exercise, um, I, I had gone to the, the people leaders underneath me and I asked them what they thought about allowing the people to choose which team they were on. So instead of doing a, a top-down reorganization, uh, attempting to do a bottom-up reorganization where I asked my leaders uh, underneath me, are, are you comfortable with this? Because essentially we're gonna ask them a question would you pick this person to be your leader? Which puts that those those managers in a very vulnerable spot because there was the risk that, of course, that maybe uh, for one of them, nobody wants to be on their team. So what we did was it was fairly basic. We went through, we identified here are the buckets that we have, and we did a dual match process where uh, explained the different teams, who was going to lead them, what was going to be their scope of work, uh, what was the purpose of the team sent out a survey to the project managers and said, rate them. Uh, in this case, there were four big buckets, rate them one through four, what teams you want to be in. Um, then this was actually the last face-to-face -face I had with my uh, uh, my directs before COVID uh, hit and we couldn't travel anymore. We got together in a room and we looked at the various ratings and we did have one particular manager who was new to the team where no one picked her team as number one. Uh, however, uh, a lot of people picked her team as number two. So I think that kind of uh, lessened the blow. Uh, when we did the reorganization, I think 92% of the people we were able to put with their number one or number two choice. Now, because we were still in that early stage transition from project management to portfolio management, from waterfall to agile, uh, what I found out is a lot of the team members, even with our description, they didn't fully understand the teams. And But I asked them, like, what did you think about the process? And one of the bits of feedback I got was could have used a slightly better description of what the teams were and what exactly we're going to be working on. But the predominant feedback I got was I've never been asked before and we appreciate mm -hmm. that you asked. And to me, that was, that was, that was meaningful that instead of, you know, doing a, a big reorganization to the team, we did this reorganization with the team and really allowed their voice to be heard. And then, um, unfortunately, we didn't get to do the larger thing. We actually had a larger plan to do this with the entire product area inclusive of all of the engineers, the product owners, et cetera. We didn't quite get there, but um, you know, it, it had a meaningful impact. And I, I will say, you know, when, I, when I left that team as the leader, uh, our engagement scores were extremely high. And in a company uh, that is not well known for employee engagement, our engagement index was above 95% for those team members. And I, I do think it was a heavy function of um, giving them that sense of autonomy, that they actually have mm -hmm. some control over their uh, their fate. I, I think it's Simon Sinek that references this, this misconception that as you move up in the organizational ladder, that your stress increases. 
that research tends to show that that's not the actual the case. And the reason why is that uh, as you move up the organizational ladder, you're less subject to other people's whims. And that feeling of insecurity, that feeling of, of not being in control negatively impacts how, how we feel about our work. This to me was an opportunity to, um, to get the team to where they, they wanted to be and g- return to them some of that sense of control. And the reality is, is the reorganization that they drove was probably a little bit different than a top-down reorganization, probably not wholly different, but it felt different. And where we did have differences, it drove some meaningful discussion with the team members because I found out some, they didn't feel comfortable going into areas that they didn't want to work, that they weren't familiar with. They valued having subject matter expertise. I had other individuals that uh, specifically wanted to move into new areas because they wanted to learn new things. And so it actually became this whole discussion about how they, as individuals, view their job, view their career. And, and to me, that, that was that was a re- drove some really powerful discussion. Yeah, I've done stuff similar with a, a number of teams, and it's funny how different people want different things, right? This group comes in a little later, stays a little later. That works better with my lifestyle right now. Uh, this group, co- you know, I like, really love working with this one person. I don't really care about the technology. Like, I can do a lot of different things. They all make me happy. I'd rather go there and work with that person. Uh, that could be the tech stack. It could be the customers. I mean, whomever, whatever it is, like we all have, we all so different. We all want different things. And, you know, who are we to think as leaders that we can, we can know all these things, even from conversations and we can make all those decisions, like let people make their own trade-offs and then letting them make that decisions is a great way to empower them to own their destiny. Right. And I've got this client now that I've been working with for a while and, and we did it initially, like where they kind of you know create the boundaries and they selected it. But now like there's times where it's like, we need to refine this. Like we've had people leave, we've had people come and we're scaling up. We have another team we need to form. How are we going to do this? And they'll just get together and most of the teams maybe stay stable, but they, they do these tweaks. It's almost like refining the team structure and we'll do this. You know, this is, I don't know, two or three times we've already done it within a product area, each product area. So it's like, Every nine, 12 months, like something changes. We got, we just, we're going to refine this. And uh, it's a whole, it's a different feeling now where it used to be a big deal when we would do that. And now it's just like, yeah, just, yeah, let's just schedule two hours. Let's figure that out. And then we'll, we'll figure, we'll go forward. You know, so it's, it's funny how like the more you do it, the more options you give people, the more it just becomes just the way you work. What, what you said there though, uh, resonated with me though, the, the idea of the leader as being this all-knowing individual, yeah. I think um, because of our heavy focus on individualism and the way that we recognize and promote people, uh, my, my, at least my experience has been, you know, someone takes an entry-level job and they're good at doing the job. And so based upon the fact that they're, they're good at doing the job, people start saying, well, this person could manage the team. And so then they move mm-hmm. into that management responsibility. And there's there's two places that they, those people typically derive authority from. Initially, they drive authority from the fact that I can do your job better than you, so you should listen to me. And then over time, their skills atrophy. And then they have to say, do what I say because I'm your boss. And that's the weakest position of leadership is, is that appeal to, to formal authority. Now, um, in my... In this kind of new new paradigm where the, the leader isn't there to command and control the team, we assume that people show up at work to do their best every day. And they're actually, you know, if they're if you don't have your, your foot on their on their head holding them down, they will actually show up and work hard because they're motivated to do so. That shifts the role of the manager. The man, the, the leader is there because I'm very good at aligning you to context. I'm there because even if I'm not as good at you as performing your individual duties, I can provide effective performance coaching in a way that helps you excel in your job. And Mm -hmm. what that means is that the the leader doesn't have to feel vulnerable because someone on their team is better than them. They they can actually celebrate that because I, I often think like, I mean, geez, the teams that I have led, if I was better than my team at everything that they did, I mean... We would have been in a world of hurt. I had I had uh, program managers that were much more effective at leading programs than ever I, I ever could. I had product owners that were much more effective at managing a backlog. 
than I ever could. I had uh, process engineers that were better at process design than ever I ever could be. And so what I looked for were what were opportunities that I could bring my skill and experience to bear in order to help them grow in a direction that they um, they should grow, but would grow a little less slowly absent my leadership. So that at the end of the year, when I write my performance assessment, I'm claiming partial credit for some of the outcomes that they're delivering, but I'm not one of those leaders who's consistently thrown up roadblocks through the course of the full year to make their lives harder and then still claim that partial credit that at the end of the year, they can say, yeah, you know, John Lert deserves a little bit of credit for my outcomes because he helped me here. He helped me there. I'm better because of his involvement. But that's typically not why we identify managers of people. We tend to focus on they were really good at the job. And so I assume that they'll be good at managing a team that's really good. at the job. Mm-hmm. They're very, very different skill sets. Like I don't, I don't, I don't want to drag us back, but where I struggled quite a bit because we 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 spent quite a bit of time earlier talking about project management, and I think holistically, in the agile sphere, there's this idea that a project manager leaves something of a bad taste in your mouth when you're talking about it. It's we don't need project managers because we're agile and. Um, we shouldn't need that type of um, management structure internally. And I think for, and, and, and I want to be conscious that I am painting with a very broad brush here. So um, like we're making a lot of assumptions in this statement, but what, what I feel like a lot of people who have that concept is they're focused on just the delivery aspect of Agile, where they're looking at, I've got an Agile delivery team. I have a Scrum team or maybe a couple Scrum teams working together and consistently getting an increment out to market, which is fantastic. Great stuff inside of there. And and maybe you don't, right? Like at that level, you don't necessarily feel the need to have a project manager that is coordinating across teams because the teams, like we were just talking about earlier, they can self-organize, they can self-manage, they can handle those dependencies. But where I think it really starts to open up uh, or, or, or become a situation for project managers is really when you start to broaden the horizon outside of the delivery teams. And we've been talking about this quite a bit over the past few recordings here, but a little, little peek behind the curtain, internally, we have a lot of what we call work streams that are concurrently going on. So legal compliance, regulations, operations, marketing, strategy, um, just a, a whole slew of them that also have work that is going on that needs to be coordinated with the actual delivery teams that are building the increment and getting it out. And I feel like there is a great opportunity for project management or some sort of coordination that goes on inside of there. And so I guess where, where my thoughts are is it is in essence becomes a scaling issue. Um, when the amount of work to coordinate becomes too much for the, the number of teams that are involved, then we start to think about, okay, well, what is that role? What is that person who kind of runs point or has the accountability of coordinating outside of just delivery? And I kind of want to get your thoughts on that. When I think about... Uh the role of project management within Agile, um, I kind of reject that the word role, because I, I think when we def- when we look at traditional RACI charts or roles and responsibilities, which I admit can provide some value, but, but that, that's actually the word I prefer, which is what is the value of project management within Agile? Because it's not about shoehorning a legacy role into a system just because we have people who have that title and we need to take care of them. It's that they possess skill sets where if they're strong project managers that are actually flexible and applicable in an agile world. And so when we think about like what are some of the base skills that a good project manager has? Well, a, a good a really good project manager is good at stakeholder engagement. Is there a need for stakeholder engagement in, in, in an agile world? Absolutely. And to your point, Jeff, if it's one team, do you need a project manager? No. I mean, I remember addressing this with a PMO that, that I inherited. The first few months, they kept asking me, well, what's the role of a project manager on a scrub team? And 
after a few months, I, I had enough trust that I could give the answer I wanted to give the entire time, which is the reason why the project managers struggling to find their role on a scrum team is because they don't have a role on a scrum team. That's not where they belong. They don't belong at that low le- in the team. They, but that doesn't mean that there's not a place for project management or the project management skill set in a scaled agile environment. When you're operating in a complex organization with a lot of various stakeholders, um, that skill can provide some, some definite advantages for the product manager because ultimately the product manager is accountable for a lot of that stakeholder engagement. But product management is being pulled in a myriad of different directions. And in my opinion, this is a space where um, a well-aligned project manager can provide some real value and get some capacity back to that product manager so that they don't have to get pulled into every single stakeholder discussion. They can utilize that that project manager as an effective delegate. Uh, and when I say delegate, it's it's really a symbiotic delegation, not a parasitic delegation. The project manager works in an area that they're really interested in because if the pro- if they're if they enjoy being a project manager, working with these stakeholder groups is something they should be involved in. But but there's other skills as well. Uh, the triple constraint. Now, Agile can make some adjustments to that triple constraint because I do think you get more value out of the same resource pool when you're doing things agilely. But you still need to understand how to build an effective roadmap. And a roadmap is really a reflection of here's the scope I'm going to complete with this fixed number of resources over this fixed time set. Well, a well-aligned project manager can help ensure that that the product manager is putting together uh, a a good roadmap because they should have a skill set in that space. Uh, Identifying risks and issues like really good project managers are not thinking just about the risk immediately in front of them. They're thinking about the risks and issues that could emerge um, in the future. And they're thinking about what adjustments can I build into the schedule today in order to ensure that that risk is appropriately mitigated um, or that I have thought about an appropriate contingency plan. So, so maybe I can build a little bit more flexibility into the schedule early. And so although the, the project manager may struggle initially, particularly if there's a scrum team, because again, I don't believe the project manager has any role within that scrum team. But when you start working in that complex ecosystem, a good, strong project management skill set can bring a lot of value to the organization. And it's not to say that the product manager or product owner can't have some project management skill set themselves. They should. But when I think about like primary accountabilities, we only can have one, number one. And I know organizations struggle mightily with uh, that ability to prioritize. But for me, the the product manager, their, their number one accountability is ensuring that the product vision is clearly established. You know, I think about number two, their, their number two is, is making sure it's well socialized in the team, making sure that there's... Um, a voice into the team. Now you can start adding in all the other responsibilities, but to me, that's where you start thinking about how do you how do you delegate? How do I leverage up that product manager to be more effective in their role? And what are the skill sets that I can surround them with that will make them that much more effective in their role? Because again, it comes back to that idea of teaming. Individuals don't need to be well-rounded. Teams need to be well-rounded. And my experience has been that if I have a really strong product manager who's really excited about the customer, that who's really excited about um, building a technical product, you know, software as a service, those same folks are typically not as excited about building out a Gantt chart. They're not as excited about some of the, the stakeholder management. They're not as excited. And so that's not where they're naturally going to go. It's not where they're going to go want to spend their time. I don't know. You made me think of something like just, I don't know, interesting about the hu- human race even. It's like, well, we're kind of, we're pretty unique that like we can scale, right? We can have large amounts of people work on something together for a common goal. Like how many other species in the world can do that? Probably not too many. It's probably one of our greatest competitive advantages as humans. But what do we need inside of those areas? Like think, take New York City, one of the largest cities, right? Like, why, how does it run? Well, there's certain rules and there's guardrails of how we operate. We know not to do certain things or there's going to be a consequence. So you could put structural things, but you also maybe need connectors because like, it's not like somebody just grows food and it goes right to somebody's table. Like 
there's a process to get there. And who manages that process to make sure you have predictability on when it's going to be there? You're getting what people want when they want it. And that we're using our economic resources most effectively. That's the same thing a project manager does, right? They add value to the system by saying, we're going to have some kind of balance between these effectiveness, efficiency, and predictability. And when you have one team or you have a team that can go all the way concept to cash, maybe you don't need that. Maybe in two teams, you don't need that. Maybe in three, you don't. But like at a certain point, when you get to a certain number of people, you can't keep it all straight. And you need somebody to kind of connect and help that make sure that process is moving and look at it systematically. And I think that's the core role of a project manager, not the, the triple constraint. You know, like what we really want out of them is that balance of those of efficiency, effectiveness, and predictability, not the, the iron triangle. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? No, I, I'd agree. I mean, to me, it's, it's a framework and framework can be controlling or a framework can be liberating. I mean, you can provide uh, enough of a framework that people, that it's not anarchy, but enough of a framework that it provides them flexibility to accomplish what they do want to accomplish. When you were talking, using the New York example, I was thinking about like, how amazing is it that just by painting a striped white line on a road that people naturally understand like here's what you know i need to stay in my lane but i can cross over in these appropriate circumstances i mean that's that's a framework that the people comfortably operate in but it's not inhibiting it's it's more liberating um in that i don't have a head-on collision and die every time i get on my car and drive 60 80 90 miles an hour and so mm-hmm. uh, so so for me that you know the, that that project management it's it's not intended to be a strict methodology where you follow every single step. I, I don't know that I've ever seen a project that follows every single step that's spelled out in PIMBOK. Um, mm-hmm. It would be pretty miserable. Um, but what, what they do is they bring a skill set that allows them to craft a framework that enables the people around them to operate and partner more effectively. And that's that's really to me I mean, why, why Agile, it's a set of principles. It's not a methodology. And why we try to build in some of this flexibility around self-organization, because I, I, in my opinion, there's there's real value in crafting that framework for people, giving people some basic rules that they understand they can follow uh, in order to not ju- not to inhibit them, but to allow them to work together more effectively towards that common goal that you spelled out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So project management, I think we're, we're highlighting it's a, it, it's a skill set. We may need different levels of it depending on our context. And so don't maybe the traditional way of thinking about it is uh, is not is not the droids we're looking for. And we just it, it, we, as agilists, maybe we shouldn't be afraid of that because right? you're right. We talked about that earlier, how people are, um, but they shouldn't be. So that's the need for everything, uh, but everything with balance. So. All right. I think, John, at this time, um, you know, we've had a good conversation. We had, we've talked about individualism. We've talked about project magic and product management and how they all balance that and uh, lots of different things in between there. But um, is there anything you want to plug or promote to our listeners uh, before we wrap up this podcast? I got, I got nothing for you other than I think that, okay. you know, I really enjoyed the conversation with you gentlemen. This is something that to me is uh, it's, it's important. I mean, the, the reason why I'm so passionate about this stuff is that I really think this stuff makes people's lives better. I mean, we spend a lot of time at work. It doesn't have to be misery. And this, you know, there, there are pathways to making our work, work life more sustainable, more enjoyable, et cetera. And to me, that's through embracing some of these underlying ideas that are not new concepts. I mean, this has been around mm-hmm. quality management in the 1950s, but we, you know, they're easy to understand. They're just really hard to do. Thank you for listening to The Agile Wire. We are consistently inspecting and adapting ourselves. We would appreciate feedback at feedback at theagilewire.com or on iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play Store. See you next time.